In this video, we'll kick off a series of videos all about social psychology. We'll discuss what the study of social psychology involves, and we'll learn about several major theories and ideas that stem from it. Humans are inherently a social species. We crave strong, stable social relationships, and for most of us, being alone is painful. The need to belong theory, for example, posits that humans have a biologically based need for interpersonal connections. Social psychologists are interested in learning about how people influence one another and about the power of situational forces on behavior. Let's discuss a few social psychological concepts then that illustrate how people influence one another and that illustrate the power of the situation. Social contagion refers to the idea that we look to others for knowledge or to decide how to act. Social comparison theory, for example, posits that we seek to evaluate our uh, abilities and beliefs by comparing them to others. According to the theory, you can make downward social comparisons and upward social comparisons, and both can be beneficial. A downward social comparison refers to comparing yourself to someone who is beneath you, who sort of performed more poorly than you, or is otherwise worse off than you. Say, for example, that you receive a C- on an exam, so you're a little bit upset. So you go out and you ask your not-so-intelligent friend what they got on the exam and find out they got a D-, and you feel much better. An upward social comparison, in contrast, refers to comparing yourself to someone who performed better than you or who is otherwise better off than you. For example, maybe you're working hard to get in shape for, for the summer or something, but you're feeling too tired to go to the gym. You might browse fitness pages on social media because seeing people in great shape motivates you to follow your training plan. This is an upward social comparison. Your social environment doesn't just influence how you feel, however. It can also influence how you actually perform, so not just your emotion, but also your behavior. For example, social facilitation refers to the phenomenon in which simply the presence of others can enhance, or facilitate, our performance. One study, for example, showed that runners complete a mile significantly faster when running with a partner compared to when they simply run against the clock. In a similar vein, a fascinating and, in my opinion, quite funny study of cockroaches found that cockroaches were significantly faster at finding their way out of a maze when they were being observed by sort of an observation box filled with other cockroaches as compared to when they ran the maze alone. At the same time, however, social disruption can occur. The presence of others can disrupt our performance in certain situations. Social facilitation tends to occur for easier tasks, whereas uh, social disruption can occur for more difficult tasks or in situations where the stakes are very high. For example, a baseball player at the end of a very important game, they might strike out if uh, they're being watched by many, many people. In this case, the social pressure might cause this baseball player to sort of choke. This is social disruption. Clearly, the situation is a strong determinant of behavior. At the same time, however, social psychological research shows that people consistently underestimate the power of situational forces on behavior. And this error is known as the fundamental attribution error. The fundamental attribution error is a cognitive bias, that is, a bias in how we think, in which we assume that the things people do are caused by dispositional factors internal things about them, such as their personality, rather than situational ones, external forces, such as social pressures or circumstances, which, as we've already seen, can be very powerful. For example, what do you think of when you observe someone causing a car accident? Most people's immediate assumption is that this person is a careless person or perhaps a bad driver. In this case, we're explaining the person's behavior causing the car crash using only dispositional factors. Now, it's quite possible that this person is actually a great driver, but maybe he was in a rush because he just found out that, I don't know, his wife is in the hospital, for example. This would be a situational explanation of the driver's behavior, but our minds don't tend to go there right away. I'll also note, by the way, that the fundamental attribution error goes by another name, which is the correspondence bias, since people assume that an observed behavior 
corresponds to some internal quality of the person. So something to keep in mind, two different names really referring to the same psychological construct. In a classic demonstration of the fundamental attribution error, students were given an essay written by a peer after being told that the essay writer was randomly assigned to write either an essay that's pro-Castro or an essay that's anti-Castro. And after reading the essay, the students were asked to guess the essay writer's true attitudes toward Castro. Now thinking about this objectively, we can't really infer anything about the essay writer's true attitudes because they were required to defend the position they were assigned. So what they wrote doesn't really tell us anything because they had no choice. But let's take a look at what the students who participated in the study actually thought. Let's start by going over the choice condition here. Uh, maybe I'll make the color the same, there we go. Let's start by uh, going over this condition. So this is when uh, the essay writer was given a choice they were allowed to write a pro-Castro or anti-Castro essay. So in that case, obviously, people are gonna write about what they believe, most likely, and so it does tell us something about the true attitude, and this is how participants responded. You can see that uh, when they were writing a pro-Castro essay, the people in the study assumed that they're pro-Castro, and so a very high value there. In contrast, when they were writing an anti-Castro essay, people assumed they're pretty anti-Castro. But more interesting is this no choice condition, which is what I've described so far. You can see that these lines are very, fairly similar. The trends are fairly similar. When they wrote a pro-Castro essay, most of the participants in the study assumed they were pretty pro-Castro even though, again, they weren't given a choice, and so we don't really know anything about their true attitudes. But people underestimate this power of the situation and assume if they wrote a pro-Castro essay, they must be pro-Castro. And similarly, uh, reading an anti-Castro essay led participants to believe that the essay writer was anti-Castro, even though, again, they weren't given a choice. This paradigm has since been replicated with all kinds of different tasks, including, for example, writing uh, essays defending political positions, as we've seen, but also giving speeches about important topics, uh, hot topics like marijuana usage, things like that. Now, interestingly, though, when we have to explain our own behavior, we're much more likely to appeal to these situational forces, likely because we feel the power that they exert over us. We don't always know what circumstances a stranger is going through, and we usually don't try to guess. This is known as the actor-observer bias. When we're explaining other people's behavior, we appeal to their disposition. He's a careless driver, right? This is the fundamental attribution error that we've seen already. But when we're explaining our own behavior, we appeal to the situation. I was just in a rush. I'm not a careless driver, right? It was the situation for me. Now, we only do this, though, when we're explaining our failures or when we're explaining the mistakes that we've made. When we're explaining our successes, in contrast, we say that it's all about us. It's our disposition, right? I earned a great grade on this exam because I'm intelligent, my disposition, not because the exam was extremely easy, for example. This is called the self-serving bias because it is self-serving. Now I want to end by noting that there are important cultural differences when it comes to attribution, explaining things, right? The findings I've described so far come from research studies that recruited participants from primarily Western countries, that is, participants from individualistic cultures such as the United States, Canada, and United uh, Kingdom. Research suggests, however, that people from Eastern countries, from collect, uh, collectivistic cultures such as China and Japan, are less likely to fall prey to the fundamental attribution error, and this is important to consider. This might be because individualistic cultures focus on the individual, so dispositional factors about the individual might be more salient. Collectivistic cultures, in contrast, focus more on the group or the collective, right? So in that context, social and situational pressures might be more salient instead. In any case, the theories and terms I've reviewed in this video are just a small sample of what the field of social psychology has told us about how people influence one another. In the next few videos, we'll delve into other important topics such as conformity and obedience, stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination, as well as helping and intervention, so stay tuned for that.